What is the issue with diabetes? How, how big a problem actually is it? Diabetes is a, is a huge global epidemic, but not many people know that. There are now 366 million people globally with diabetes. By 2030, that will be over half a billion people. So the numbers are at you know, epidemic proportions. People think that diabetes is, is not a serious disease, but actually diabetes kills around 5 million people every year. So it's a disease that people should be very afraid of, um, and, and they're not. Two thirds of diabetes now is in low and middle income countries. It used to be a disease that people associated with the, the rich and elderly, and it's not that way anymore. Diabetes has not moved out of high income countries. What it's done is extend into low and middle income countries where they're already fighting infectious disease, maternal mortality. So it, it becomes a double burden of, of disease. So it's now hitting the countries that can least afford it. And we've now got World Diabetes Day. Um, you yes. do a survey every year. What, what, what are we seeing? this year compared, compared with last year? And what we're, we're seeing, we're the, seeing the numbers increase now from 366 million to 371 million. And what we're seeing is an increase in every country in the world, an increase in, in expenditure on diabetes and an increase in, in mortality and also in morbidity um, because we're seeing an increase in uh, renal failure, blindness, amputations, cardiovascular disease, which are all the major complications of diabetes. People don't usually die from diabetes itself. They die from something else. Now, one of the things we wanted to discuss this morning was the link between health and environment. Health and climate change are intimately connected and you, you can't separate out the two. And if we take the example of, of diabetes, there are direct connections and indirect connections. Some of the direct connections are that basically uh, an, an overheating world with hotter, hotter temperatures will have an impact on people with type 2 diabetes. It will increase um, mortality, for example. And in many of the countries of the world that we're, we're dealing with, the low-income countries, you can find um, an obese mother, for example, uh, with a malnourished child. And if you look at it in terms of, of their nutritional status, the mother may be obese, but she can actually be um, malnourished at the same time because she's lacking vital nutrients. So what we're seeing is um, a, co a completely dysfunctional agricultural system and global food system intimately linked to what's happening with, uh, with, with climate change. That those are some of the direct links but some of the other common drivers are things that drive climate change and things that are also things that drive diabetes. And urbanisation is linked to climate change, it's driving climate change but it's also driving uh, a sort of a particular unhealthy lifestyle a nutritional transition into people eating different sorts of foods, people leading a more sedentary lifestyle, finding it harder to walk, to cycle. What is the problem with that having been seen in silos? Because because we're, we're recognising now that the world is, is interdependent, but actually the way policy is often uh, created is, is that there's here's a health issue, here's an environment issue. What's been the problem with that approach? I think that's been the problem, a silo approach has been a problem not just for, for health and climate change but really across the board. So we have these issues and, and both these issues need a very, very long-term political vision. Um, both diabetes and both climate change are not things that will be fixed within a normal three-year political timetable, which is usually the term of office of a, of a government. These need an intergenerational vision, they, they need a 50-year time horizon. And if you look at them separately and you don't see the connections between the two, um, then your policies are just simply dysfunctional. So if that's the problem, what's the solution? We have at the moment a number of major policy processes, global policy processes going on. So there is the whole uh, follow up to Rio on climate change. There was the Rio plus 20 climate change meeting in June. We have another process that's going on for non-communicable diseases with the UN summit that was held last year. Our job has been to bring those two together and so that when the world agenda, the global development agenda changes in 2015 with the end of the Millennium Development Goals, that whatever comes afterwards is actually integrated. Because there's a, a very worrying discourse out there that um, in, in terms of global development, we've done health. Um, you know, we've we fixed AIDS, we've fixed malaria, we've fixed TB, we've, we've done a fair bit on maternal mortality and therefore that we should move on to climate change and we should move on to more issues more related to economic productivity. But if you don't see how they're intimately linked, um, 
then we're never going to get to proper solutions. So one of the problems with Rio Plus 20 that some people say is that actually you saw the failure of global multilateral negotiations and actually the answer is going to be in sort of very different approaches which are more local, regional approaches. So we would say that you still have to have those global processes, those global policy processes. Those are still very important. And so what happens, the sustainable development agenda after 2015 that's going to be put in place will drive change. It will drive financial flows as the, as the MDGs did. So that's still going to be important. But at the same time, you have to follow the whole chain right down from, you know, regional to national to city level and right down to community level and see what's going to work at, at different levels. So just, just to pick up on that point, I mean, mm. isn't the private sector, big business, the problem. We've got the agrochemical industry, we've got processed foods, we've got uh, rising use of antibiotics, pesticides. Yeah. You know, you know, when you actually look at the system, yeah. um, it's still based on profit maximization and, yes, and on driving a system that is, some say, is completely unsustainable. I, mean, I think that this is something that, that shareholders have not been smart enough about. Um, and I, I think that we need to get across the message to people, including the shareholders of these major companies, uh, that they should be supporting companies when, when they attempt to change. And I think we've seen some interesting examples by some companies that have attempted to change um, and their shareholders have not been, not been with them. And I think also that from an NGO point of view, we should have been in, the, in those shareholder meetings saying, you know, yes, there needs to be change and we need to have a, a whole different concept of what we consider is you know development modernity we have to look really 50 years on at the future that we want to leave for our our children um, because i'm i'm sh you know sure as hell it's not the future where we're going that's not what we intended to do um, when when we set off on this on this path for development so I you you've got the science that looks at the projections you know you can see what's mm. going to happen if we don't do anything and yet we're not doing anything or we're not doing anything nearly fast enough well, what's the answer to actually connect the problem to actual action? I think one of the problems with climate change and with diabetes is that the, the numbers and the scale of the problem is so big and it's so scary that we tend to hide under our desks and say, you know, I'll, I'll get to that one tomorrow. And I think we have, to, we have to bring this down to a level where people can see what can be done and can see where change can be made because otherwise it looks as though it's just an inevitability and we, we don't know how to avoid it. And I think where you can see that level is more at the, it's more at the city level and it's more at the community level. And if we take the example of New York, where you know, very real steps have been made to uh, inform people about the calorific value, for example, of what they're eating, very real steps have been made in that city to uh, make it easier um, for, for people to take public transport, for people to, to have a, a physically active life. I think if you look at that example, that, that is probably where the major innovations are going to come and that's, that's what we see in many parts of the world now. If we continue to see this sort of splintered approach and siloed approach, what do you see the future in 10 to 20 years time? I think the, the future is, is very bleak, not only in climate change but certainly for diabetes. I mean, For, for diabetes, we will have um, 500 million people with diabetes. Those people are already on the, on the road to d disease. There's nothing that we can do now to stop that number reaching 500 million. So we will have half a billion people, which is extraordinary. What we're trying to do now is really level that off and say, you know, can, can we cap it at half a billion? If we can't do that, then I think what, what, what we will see um, is we'll see what we've got now, which is an increase in childhood obesity, which is a completely, you know, preventable tragedy because those children go on to be sick young, young adults. Um, and I think we will see uh, disease become normal um, and we will see life expectancy fall. How confident and optimistic are you that we'll actually find a way through and what, will, what do you think will be the trigger for that? For me the trigger will be um, a, a people's movement and I think that's what we saw with HIV AIDS and, and we don't yet have that. I think on non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and chronic respiratory disease, which are all connected to climate change. I think we have an NGO movement. And as I said, we have 2,000 organizations working there. But what we don't have is public outrage. Um, and that's what we, ha we had with HIV AIDS. And that was a major driver. The trigger will come when people say, you know, enough is enough. We have enough disease here. I, you know, I don't want this future for my children. And 
maybe we see some different thinking emerging, um, this whole concept of instead of GDP, gross domestic happiness as, a, as an indicator. I think we're going to have to have a, a, a complete re-evaluation um, about what modernity and what development really means, that it's got to be more than economic growth. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.